others in many respects. During the reading of the epistle, we've heard how it is necessary to rebuke and to correct any thing that goes against the understanding of what Christ has given us. And indeed, Christ showed us by his own deeds that sort of thing when he threw out the um, traders in the temple and rebuked the Pharisees and Sadducees which were preaching wrongly the whole theology of salvation at that time. Many of the saints continued to take on that task which is not without risk because people judged them a lot for that. Saint Nicholas had or lived in a time when the church was particularly experiencing all sorts of heresies, that is, wrong teachings, wrong understandings. For this reason, most of the ecumenical councils which corrected those heresies were in the second part of the um, the first millennium. They were called in order to correct things and to clarify them so that from then on there would be no need for any disputes or wrong teachings and understandings. One of the most prevalent heresies which occurs to this very day in various ways, known as Arianism, due to a, a clergyman called Arius who lived at the time of St. Nicholas, which tries to teach that Christ was not truly God, but a created creature. And there are many versions of that. Um, to this day, the sects like Jehovah's Witnesses and Seventh-day Adventists still preach that type of um, theology. It's very wrong. I won't go into why specifically, only that if Christ was not fully God, then we have not received our salvation yet, and we must await some sort of saving. But, indeed, we know that Christ is indeed God in full, and also fully man, and therefore our salvation has been um, correctly <coughs> brought about. There are also many others outside the Orthodox Church, for example, the Romans, that will say that, yes, Christ is God, but then when it comes to discussing details, it doesn't make sense what they come up with. They trash that idea um, in various ways, which is for you to study, although I can say to you that... Um, one, one of the big things there that they preach is that Christ did not attain the fallen nature when he was born, which means that he was not fully man, which again goes against the whole idea. St. Nicholas was the one that slapped this Arius because of his um, teaching that Christ was not God. And it was to a scandal to many that see it. I don't know why, but if a person is of that nature that no matter how often you re rebuke them and prove to them otherwise, they still continue to hold on to their wrong teachings. Sometimes a slap is needed to bring them to their senses. In the case of Arius, it did not. And he died a very horrible death. I think his bowels and all his insides came out of him. In any case, that's the um, one of the main things about St. Nicholas. As you know, he is the patron saint of travellers, particularly seamen, and um, many people in their motor cars and whatever have an icon of him. It's a good, good thing to have. There are numerous temples dedicated to his name and many people named in honour of him. Could you tell people how you went to St. Nicholas and people were waving and you did the service for them? Well, you've said it, haven't you? No. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Father. Good. Um, 
when we were travelling in 84, we did end up in Rome. And um, it was the last country of our journey. We were planning to go to see St. Nicholas as relics and, and um, where, where they're held today in Italy, in Bari. And we did not. We did not, whether it was uh, sheer laziness or whatever. But because we sort of promised to do it and didn't, we had a very torrid time getting out of Rome, say that. Um, St. Nicholas didn't seem to bless our journey back. So we promised again to come and visit him in our next trips, which we did um, a decade after. After visiting Greece, taking a ship to Bari, Italian um, seaport, and going to the temple where St. Nicholas's relics are kept, um, mainly under the jurisdiction of the Pope of Rome, but on the side there is a, a shrine dedicated also for the Orthodox. And whenever you come in there, you will see lots of um, Orthodox people hanging around, hoping that a priest will come and do a service to St. Nicholas, an Orthodox priest. And they do come. And I was one of those that came um, to the joy of those there. Of course, the Orthodox by far venerate St. Nicholas even greater than um, the Roman Catholics do or anybody else. As I said to you, there's this uh, anecdote in Russia amongst the uh, sort of um, uneducated. He asked them, what's the Holy Trinity? They'll say, oh, it's the Father. Um, now it's Christ, the Mother of God and St. Nicholas. That's how much that sort of penetrated into the psyche, the great veneration of St. Nicholas after the Mother of God in the um, Eastern countries. One of the things that has come to our attention, which I want to mention, I don't normally talk about these things, and that's the situation with our chapel. About 18 months ago, the bishop here of Antioch, who gave an edict that um, we were to go into the catacombs, hide ourselves, because of all the tyranny that was coming around, and to um, serve from that area, which we have done. That edict, as far as I know, has not been removed. And in fact, it was um, only a confirmation of the type of um, obediences that we were given even before um, we came under the jurisdiction of Antioch. Our idea is quite simple. Today you find in the Orthodox world, particularly in the West, not amongst normal people generally, but about uh, but amongst the clergy, the um, bishops and whatever, huge arguments about quite irrelevant things, such things as canons and um, this and that, would bear no real relevance to salvation of one's soul. It's something that the devil uses, the passions of people who want to be recognised and put themselves forward as better than others. And so they make up all sorts of things that they are the only true group or the others are not and that you should join them, etc, etc. We don't go along with that and we never have. The truth about orthodoxy is quite simple. If a jurisdiction, that is, a group, orthodox, has apostolic succession, that is, if it can clearly demonstrate that they go back through their bishops to one of the apostles without a break, and that they have never absorbed any heresies, any wrong teachings or anything like this, 
then they are legitimate, irrespective of what other bishops or others might say about them. Yes, they might have various um, deficiencies in certain ways, which I won't go into, but overall, they are still part of the church. They are not separated from the Orthodox Church. Sometimes we have visiting clergy come here from different jurisdictions and we don't mind co-serving with them, not because we are under them or we are somehow obedient to them, but purely out of the fellowship associated with that. Because of this we get lots of criticisms. Um, there was one last year when a bishop came, and you might know, and um, he was a person that we had known from our youth who was leaving Australia for good, and we didn't mind to just have a, a service with him, um, just to get out of that friendship and fellowship of Orthodox Christians, irrespective of what his particular views politically were. I don't care about that. Of course, people pick up that and by association criticise us and others like that, thinking that they are somehow aligned with them, which we are not. Our direction in um, the church has been quite clearly given to us several decades ago by holy people, and with God's help we've tried to stick to that as best we can. That's one reason why openly we really commemorate the um, bishops that we're associated with, so as not to tempt others. However, when I do the proscomedia, we commemorate those bishops which we know we should commemorate. Therefore, if anybody ever says something to you about that, just be aware that being given an obedience to be in the catacombs, not to push forward any particular group or any particular person or anything like that, but to simply do the work of God as has always been done, particularly with brotherhoods. Brotherhoods arose right in the first century of Christianity as groups not under a bishop specifically, but as um, uh, people put, brought, brought together to achieve certain objectives in the church, whatever it might be. It might be um, doing some sort of um, charity work or something like that, or painting icons. In our case, it's the um, expounding of orthodoxy in the English language through books, um, teachings and services, which we have been doing now since 1983-2. That's the whole thing. It's that, that simple, that clear, and I want you to always remember that. If a group has apostolic succession, has not absorbed heresy in any way, then there is no reason for that group not to be part of the Orthodox Church. And like a few weeks ago, I said to you about the calendar where um, a particular priest who was very zealous for the church calendar to the extent of pushing others away that were not with the church calendar but were with the world calendar, saw a vision or something of Christ with um, some on the left of him and some on the right. And when asked what does that mean, Christ said that we have, I have children which follow the church calendar and haven't changed anything, and others which, for whatever reason, have been placed in a situation where they are using the world calendar but they are still my children and in time we hope that that uh, situation will be healed because it's not something that is traditional in orthodoxy the orthodox church has always had only one church calendar let's wish it it does its what cycle of services according to that that's why today for example in the world calendar it's the 19th of december but on the church calendar is December the 6th. St. Nicholas's 
commemorated on that day, being close to nativity. That's why the Western world has somehow um, welded him into Santa Claus. Not something that the um, Holy Orthodox Church has ever um, spoken of like that. It's not Santa Claus. St. Nicholas is a great saint and a bishop of the church. And you should read his life. One of the most um, enlightening and greatest lives of all the saints. I think that's all I have to say. Next week on Saturday is the Another feast day of our temple, the St. Herman, Herman Wonderworker of Alaska. Now, it's very interesting. On the church calendar, it's December the 25th. Which, as you know, the world celebrates Christmas. We celebrate our nativity on the 25th of December as well. But, according to the church calendar, that is the 7th of January about two weeks behind on that but on the 25th next Saturday we have a great Saint Herman wonder worker of Alaska so we too celebrate but a different feast if you know what I mean there are plenty of indicators about the rightness of the church calendar and all the problems that the world calendar causes when it tries to be inserted into the service of the church. I hope to show you a bit of a demonstration of that using some visual aids, how this works and how things can go terribly wrong if you fiddle with that which the saints have given us in the church regarding the calendar, because the calendar is the one which um, controls the breathing of the church. The prayers, the daily prayers, the hourly prayers even, right down to the hours. It's a wondrous thing if you want to ever study that, and that's why we ask if you can sometimes come and help with the singing, that you get an idea how all these things fit together every day in every service. So please, next Sunday we'll have God willing the services again on um, 10.30 on Sunday. If anybody wants to have confession on any particular Sunday, could you let us know beforehand, before the um, communion, so we know. Because otherwise I won't, I won't know that you know, somebody does. I think that's all. Yeah? Nothing else to say. Anybody else have anything?